Hello guys and girls, Raj here, back with another video. In this video, we are going to go over Kubernetes best practices. So one of the feedback I get uh, from my students and viewers is uh, when they search for Kubernetes best practices, a lot of best practices come up. So how to answer this question in an interview? So in this video, I'm going to go over five key best practices that you should definitely mention in your interview. All right, let's get started. The first best practice is use Kubernetes namespace. So namespaces create multiple virtual cluster boundary within one physical cluster. It also provides scope for naming. So if we look into this in a detail, one EKS cluster can have multiple namespaces and you can see team A and team B can have the same deployment app name, web server app in two different namespaces but in the same EKS cluster. Another huge advantage of namespace is physical separation of resource requirement. So let's say team C is running a badly optimized application you could allocate specific amount of CPU and memory to this namespace so that it doesn't spill over or use up CPU and memory from namespace A and namespace B. And it is also useful for namespace specific accesses. Which brings us to the second best practice and this is the most important best practice which is implement resource requests and limits. So resource requests and limit is a way to request certain amount of CPU and memory for your containers. So I have a separate video going over detail on uh, this separately. I'm going to give a link up top and this is how scaling is controlled. So let's say this container is requesting CPU of 500 millicore and 256 maybe bytes of memory. So basically this is requesting a half of one vCPU and 256 maybe bytes of memory. And the limits is uh, one vCPU and 512 maybe bytes of memory. So this container cannot use more than these limits. So going back to the previous example where you have an application which is running a badly optimized app. So you can set resources for namespaces using resource quotas. Uh, for example, the kind is resource quota, and you can see request.cpu and request.memory and limits.cpu and limits.memory restricts how much CPU and memory that namespace can use. So one thing to keep in mind, uh, when CPU reaches limit, it will throttle, so the container will throttle, so you might observe slowness for your program. Uh, but memory is not a throttleable resource. So when memory reaches limit, pod will be evicted. So keep an eye out in the monitoring system. And if you see a container is reaching the memory limit frequently, then you know you need to adjust the memory limit in that pod spec file. Proper requests and limits save cost as well because you ensure that a container doesn't take up or doesn't uh, reserve more CPU and memory which is needed. So this is generally the biggest cost factor for the applications running on production. And there are a lot of tools to help you on that. Uh, under the hood, the metric server tells you how much CPU and memory are being used uh, for the container. Uh, but to do this manually would be very difficult. Uh, so there are a lot of tools available in the market, such as CloudWatch Container Insights for AWS. You have KubeCost. I, I personally used KubeCost, highly recommend it. Uh, Cloud Health, Kubernetes Resource Report, etc. So if you mention uh, some of this to the interviewer, interviewer will be very impressed. Next, Kubernetes best practice is use readiness and liveness probes. So these help in health check of your Kubernetes pods. So you are probably thinking, well, Raj, uh, replica set restores pods, right? So if you have a replica set set to th three 
and if a pod goes down a replica set will bring a pod up and everything will be up and running uh, so what's the big deal about readiness and liveness well let's imagine that your app, app takes a minute to warm up and start your service won't work until it is up and running even though the process has started you will also have issues if you want to scale up this deployment to have multiple copies a new copy should not receive traffic until it is fully ready but by default kubernetes starts sending it traffic as soon as the process inside the container starts by using a readiness probe kubernetes waits until the app is fully started before it allows the service to send traffic to the new copy. And for liveness, uh, let's imagine another scenario where your app has a nasty case of deadlock, causing it to hang indefinitely and stop serving requests. Maybe going back to the previous example, uh, let's say your pod uh, reaches CPU limit and is throttling very badly. But because the container is still running, uh, Kubernetes thinks everything is fine and continues to send requests to this pod. By using a liveness probe, Kubernetes detects that the app is no longer serving requests and restarts the offending pod. There are different types of probes uh, using which you can do readiness and liveness checks. The most common is the HTTP probes. You can create a lightweight HTTP server inside your application uh, to respond to liveness probe. So Kubernetes pings a path, and if it gets a HTTP response uh, in the 200 or 300 range, it marks the app as healthy. Otherwise, it is marked as unhealthy. Moving on to the next best practice, you should always secure your Kubernetes uh, so this one, you kind of demonstrating your uh, high level understanding of Kubernetes. Um, so when it comes to Kubernetes security, there are two different kinds of security. Uh, make sure you, sh you tell interviewer that, uh, okay, I know about the application security. So this one people will mention, right? Um, application security as in security of pod, namespace, node, using RBAC, IRSA, etc. But the other big kind of Kubernetes security is the security of the DevOps pipeline. Uh, so you can do that by implementing proper authorization. Uh, you scan the repository. You scan running container. Also, you can mention that uh, if your application has additional security compliance, such as FedRAMP, HIPAA, SOC, etc., uh, choose proper AWS accounts uh, for, to fulfill this. For example, uh, if the application requires to be FedRAMP high compliant, then they need to run in Golf Cloud. The last best practice is to implement day two operations. So implement a detective control. So collect and analyze audit logs and alarm on certain behavior. Uh, also understand Kubernetes termination lifecycle. There may be reasons why Kubernetes might terminate perfectly healthy container. Uh, so if you are updating your application or if you drain a node, uh, Kubernetes will terminate all pods. Uh, so it is very important that you use rolling update. With rolling update, Kubernetes slowly terminates old pods while spinning up new ones so your application can still serve traffic while the update is going on. It is also important that your application handle termination gracefully so that there is minimal impact on the end user and the time to recovery is as fast as possible. This means that your application needs to handle the termination signals. So when Kubernetes is trying to terminate a pod, it sends some signal uh, to the pod and your app should be able to handle it and begins to save something if it needs to save, shut down a process gracefully, uh, etc. Finish any work which is left and any other similar tasks. Also make sure there's the incident response plan in place. You should be able to identify and isolate any pod 
or node in case something bad happens and you should always run load and penetration testing before you implement your application in production. Those are the five best practices uh, for your Kubernetes interview. All right, guys and girls, that's the video. If you find this video useful, please do all the YouTube stuff, like this video, uh, subscribe, uh, comment. Also, actually, in the comment, let me know if there are other questions that's in your mind for Kubernetes that you want me to go over. All right, guys and girls, that's it for this video. I'll see you guys and girls in the next video. Bye.